Good morning and greetings from Monterey Bay Academy. It is really my honor and privilege to welcome you this morning for Alumni Weekend. We are glad to be back in the, uh, the comfort of one another's company. Although it's still different than what any of us expected, we are glad that we are here today to share in the special thought of uh, gathering, reunions, and we're excited that you can connect with one another with your classmates. And we are still praying, we are still hoping that next year we'll be back in person. But after, after having missed last, um, last year, we're glad that we can be here together. So on behalf of all of us here at Monterey Bay Academy, our faculty and staff, especially our alumni um, director and uh, Mrs. Kinsey Spire, we are glad that you're joining us here today and want to welcome you to the Sabbath. Our Father in Heaven, we thank you so much for the graciousness of allowing us to come together as family, allowing us to bring our thoughts and our, our friendships and our time together to share in this special time. Please be with our speaker as he shares with us today, and uh, he allows us to come into the throne room of heaven to take in the nourishment that he'll provide that comes from your heart to us wherever we're going. So help us have ears to hear, hearts that will be open, and uh, a memory that we can tuck away um, again, for this time together. We love you. Help us keep our eyes looking up. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, we're going to start with I've Been Redeemed. I cannot guarantee you that I'm going to keep, be able to keep changing pages. Um, so, I'm going to assume you kind of know. You can figure it out. I've Been Redeemed. And whatever we sing, just, just follow that or not, you know, whatever. I've been redeemed. I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. By the blood of the Lamb. I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Filled with the Holy Ghost, I am. All my sins are washed away. I've been redeemed. And that's not all. And that's not all. There's more besides. There's more besides. And that's not all. And that's not all. There's more besides. And that's not all. There's more besides. All. All. There's more besides. I've been to the river and I've been baptized. All my sins are washed away. I've been redeemed. He's coming back. He's coming back to take us home. To take us home. He's coming back. He's coming back to, to take, take us home. home. He's coming back, back to take, take us home. home. So we can reap what we have sown. All my sins are washed away. I've been redeemed. I've been redeemed. I've been redeemed. I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. By the blood of the Lamb. I've been redeemed. I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb Filled with the Holy Ghost I am All my sins are washed away I've been redeemed it wasn't, That wasn't too bad for, for sort of waking up Our next one is called Wonderful Peace it's, it's in the hymnal and we don't do it as much And I really like this song so we're going to do it. That's really the only reason. That's no, I don't really have anything other than that. So um, some of you may remember or, or not. Uh, Far away in the depths of my spirit tonight rolls a melody sweeter than psalm. Oh, you're so good, Donna. Thank you. Far away in the depths of my spirit tonight Rolls a melody sweeter than song In celestial like strains it unceasingly falls O'er my soul like an infinite calm Peace, peace, wonderful What a 
treasure I have in this wonderful peace, buried deep in the heart of my soul, so secure that no power can mine it away, while the years of eternity down the rough pathway of time. Make the Savior your friend ere the shadows grow dark. Oh, accept of this sweet peace of life. Peace, peace, wonderful peace coming down from the Father above. Sweep over my spirit forever, I pray. In fathomless billows of love. We're lifting his name on high because he came from heaven to earth. His death on the cross was not finished the work, but his resurrection, in fact, seals it. So we invite you to stand for, Lord, I lift your name on high.
assurance Jesus is mine Oh what a foretaste of glory divine Air of salvation Purchase of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story. This is my. Welcome to that of Principal P.J. Dimming. It was very difficult for all of us when we realized we were going to have to have another year without having an in-person alumni reunion. I am grateful, however, for modern technology, and that has allowed us to plan a virtual program. And while it is not our first choice for doing an alumni weekend, it does provide us with the opportunity of coming together, even if it is on a computer screen. Last year, we were unable to recognize and honor our alumni. So this year, I am happy that we are able to honor four very special people. For these awards, nominations were submitted to the alumni office, and then alumni board members reviewed them and confirmed their selection based on the criteria of a life lived in service to MBA, or to their church, or to their community, and in some cases, all three. So if you know of an alum who you would like to see honored for their life of service, send me their name. The alumni office accepts nominations until January 15th of each year, and we will now begin with our two alumni of the year. 
Hubert Cisneros grew up in Boulder, Colorado, where he came from a very large family with deep Seventh-day Adventist roots. He has a compelling testimony as a youth that brought him to Monterey Bay Academy, where he graduated with the class of 1970. Following his graduation, Hubert attended La Sierra University and Pacific Union College, where he earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in theology. While still in college, he met and married Lucy, the love of his life. His work in ministry also began while still in college, spending his summers serving as voice director at Camp Wawona and Camp Yavapines. Hubert has served the Adventist Church in a variety of ways in multiple locations across the United States. He started his ministry in Arizona, where he served for seven years, pastoring several churches, including the local Adventist Academy. In 1982, he moved to Oklahoma, where he pastored for six years, and then returned to Arizona for an additional 11 years, serving in the Arizona Conference Office in a variety of positions, including Ministerial Director, Youth Director, and Health and Temperance Director. In 1999, Hubert and Lucy found themselves making another move to Ohio, where Hubert served in the Ohio Conference as the Executive Secretary and the leader of Church Ministries, Evangelism, and Hispanic Ministries. Eleven years later, in 2010, one more move was made to Nebraska, where Hubert served as Youth and Church Ministries Director for Mid-American Union Conference. While serving in this capacity, he guided ministries for children, family, and Native Americans as well as coordinated activities for pathfinders, senior youth, young adults, Hispanic ministries, and global evangelism. In 2018, Hubert retired, but retirement is a relative term as Hubert continued to pastor in a three-church district in southeastern Nebraska. Today, he is still serving his community full-time, even in retirement bringing his years of ministry service to 45 and counting. Throughout his years of ministry service, Hubert has had a love for writing and has authored training manuals for small group evangelism, as well as co-authored a five-volume set of books on how to do youth ministry on the local level. He also has a deep love for music, dedicating his musical talents to God early in his life. Hubert also has been a strong advocate for Hispanic, Native American, and immigrant youth. He is a champion for the underprivileged and has used every opportunity given to him to serve these important minority communities. Hubert was recently presented a Lifetime Service Award on behalf of his ministry within the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It was noted during the presentation that through the efforts of his ministry, thousands of children, youth, and young adults have chosen Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Monterey Bay Academy Alumni Association is honored to recognize Hubert Cisneros for the ministry he has so freely given to the numerous churches, organizations, and conferences across the United States. During his 45 years of service to the Adventist Church, Hubert has blessed many people as a pastor, evangelist, youth director, and administrator. Thank you, Hubert, for the countless lives you have influenced for Christ and for your dedication and devotion to selflessly serving others. Kent Hansen came to Monterey Bay Academy in the fall of 1969 from Sonora, California. He spent two years at MBA, graduating with the class of 1971. Following graduation, he continued his education at La Sierra College when the campus was part of Loma Linda University. He graduated in 1975 with a Bachelor of Arts in History and Political Science, followed by a Juris Doctor from Willamette University in 1979. Leadership and service to others are gifts that God has blessed Kent with. During his years at La Sierra, he was deeply involved in student government and also served as editor of the student newspaper. 
He continued to use these gifts following his college graduation, serving as an Associate Dean of Students and General Counsel for Loma Linda University from 1979 to 1982. He then joined a law firm in Corona, California, and in 1988, where his leadership abilities were recognized and awarded when he became a named partner of the firm Clayson, Mann, Yeager, and Hansen. Working as their managing attorney, Kent focused on educational law, healthcare law, nonprofit corporate law, and employment defense. Along with his continued service to his law firm and his role as general counsel for Loma Linda University, Kent has taught at both La Sierra University and Loma Linda University. He has also continued his love of service by staying actively involved in community service projects. In addition to his role as general counsel, Kent is an assistant professor at Loma Linda University School of Dentistry, teaching a course in dentistry and the law. Not long ago, an article was written about Kent and published in the La Sierra News. It start, stated the following, as general counsel for Loma Linda University Health, Kent Hansen oversees the 30 corporations that comprise Loma Linda University Health, which functions as one of only 125 academic health centers in the United States. Loma Linda University Health employs about 16,000 people and annually educates 4,500 students in the health sciences. Kent is the principal architect of the institution's system of governance and organization. Kent has maintained his connection with La Sierra University over the years in various ways, including serving as university legal counsel through his law firm. He is quoted as saying, the realities of racial and gender diversity learned on the La Sierra campus influenced my drafts of the first affirmative action plans for Loma Linda University and Andrews University and inspired my personal and professional commitments to fight racial and gender discrimination whenever I encounter it. In recognition of all of Kent has contributed to Loma Linda and to La Sierra University, Kent received an honorary Doctor of Law from La Sierra on June 18, 2017. Such recognition is evidence of Kent's servant heart. Monterey Bay Academy is honored to recognize Kent Hansen for his commitment to excellence, his dedication to higher Adventist education, and his devotion to serving his community. It was 1968, one of the most historic years in American history a year full of social and political changes, as well as historic tragedies and triumphs. It was during this time the Rainbow Fin Company began in SoCal, California. Glenn DeWitt and his wife Kathy had recently moved from the East Bay to 37th Avenue, where they began shaping surfboards for their own personal use at their Pleasure Point Surf Shack. In need of fins, Glenn visited the Young Fin Company, where original owner Tom Knight sold Glenn a fin and offered him a job glassing and polishing fins. Glenn accepted the job and suddenly life was good for the young couple, earning $400 a month making fins and surfing. It couldn't get any better, Glenn recalls. Then in 1970, he became co-owner of Rainbow Fin Company with Tom Knight, and life was the best it had ever been. However, with the fast and furious lifestyle that followed, the company soon took a turn that nearly ended it, its existence. Between fatherhood, surfing, work, and living a party lifestyle, life began to spin out of control, and Glenn realized that a personal change was desperately needed. It was decided to close Rainbow Finn, and he and Tom moved their families to Angwin, California, where they both enrolled at Pacific Union College to study theology. 
While there, they both experienced a real spiritual awakening, but soon realized that they could not support their families as full-time students. Praying that God would intervene and show them how they could continue their education and pay the bills at the same time, a new opportunity came, and they started making skateboards. Their days were spent going to school, and at night, they were glassing, cutting, and grinding their new orders for downhill racing skateboards. One evening, after beginning this new venture, Tom came to Glenn and said that God had told him they needed to go to Monterey Bay Academy. With the desire to become a chaplain, Glenn was not convinced that this was the direction that they should go. It was not at all what he had planned, but Glenn put out his fleece with God and he said he wanted an undeniable sign that MBA was where he belonged. Miraculously, the answer came shortly after he and Tom were making a sales trip to Southern California when they stopped in to see a friend, Art Vanderveer, former boys dean at MBA. During the course of their conversation and not knowing what Tom had said to Glenn before the trip, Art told Glenn, you need to go to Monterey Bay Academy and see Principal Harvey both and reopen Finn, Rainbow Finn Company. Glenn got his undeniable answer. They would go to Monterey Bay Academy. Arriving on campus in 1975, Elder Voth welcomed them with open arms, showed them the building the business would be in, and told them that anything they needed for operating would be set up for them. There was only one stipulation. They had to hire students to work in the business. With that stipulation, Glenn's direction in ministry was laid out before him. The Ministry of Mentoring Teenagers for Christ. Eventually, Glenn and Kathy took over sole ownership of the company when Tom chose to pursue a career in the medical field in Southern California. Glenn and Kathy's intervention and interaction with students continued to grow throughout their years at MBA. Rainbow Finn provided them with an amazing avenue to train and mentor students, helping them to develop work habits and skills that would be beneficial to them throughout their life. Glenn's desire to bring kids into a closer relationship with Christ also continued to grow. In 1999, he developed a Sabbath school program called Set in Stone. It was a student-driven program, planned, prepared, and implemented by the kids and for the kids. My goal with the ministry of Set in Stone, says Glenn, was to put the cookies on the bottom shelf. In other words, I wanted the truth of the unconditional love of Jesus, his grace and his mercy, to be easily grasped and understood by all who became involved in the program. For 12 years, Set in Stone provided MBA with a ministry that reached students in a way no other program had. It combined art, music, outreach, evangelism, Bible study, and the spoken word in an effort to present the gospel of Jesus Christ in simple and easy to understand concepts to kids with searching hearts. Along with running the Rainbow Finn business and mentoring high school teenagers in the workforce, Kathy's spiritual ministry on campus grew as well. For over 30 years, she ministered to the younger children on campus, leading out in the primary Sabbath school division for the MBA church. The impact that Glenn and Kathy DeWitt have had on the campus of Monterey Bay Academy over the last 45 years is immeasurable. The skills and work ethic they developed and nurtured in students is priceless, and the lives they influenced for Christ is countless. MBA is proud to honor Kathy and Glenn DeWitt for the incredible difference they have made on this campus and in the lives of the students they have come in contact with.
the birds sing all the day. It's a gay, pleasing sight from morning till night at MBA. Hail MBA, we love you. Your best in the West, we say. Thank you. 
It warms my heart this morning to be able to introduce to you our Worship Hour speaker, Icky Taney. I had originally asked Icky to be our speaker for last year during Alumni Weekend. He was supposed to be here celebrating his 25th class reunion with the class of 1995, and I was looking so forward to seeing him again. But then, as you all know, COVID-19 hit, and all of our lives were changed significantly. And one of the big changes that we experienced here at MBA was the cancellation of our in-person alumni weekend. I had hoped that this year would be different, and I think we all had hoped that it would be different. But once again, we were forced to cancel our in-person alumni weekend. I was disappointed, as I know many of you were, but I began making plans for a virtual alumni weekend. And one of the first tasks that I always do is I work on finding our worship hour speaker. I really feel that that's one of the most important aspects to our alumni weekend. It sets the tone of the weekend and so often we are blessed significantly by the message of the speaker of that uh, worship hour. So as I began thinking of who I could have for this year, the first person that came to mind again was Icky. I sent him an email and I asked him if it would be at all possible for him to once again be our speaker for the weekend. An immediate response came back and he said, I am open to whatever you need of me. Anything the MBA team needs, just give me the details and I'm on it. Those words were an answer to my prayers. Currently, Icky serves as the Senior Youth and Young Adult Ministries Director for the Southern California Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. He is passionate about youth ministries, and he believes that youth are imperative to the health of our church. Thank you, Icky, for your willingness to speak to us today, and I know that your words will bring us much needed hope and encouragement. Everyone, happy Sabbath and welcome to Alumni Weekend. Such a great pleasure to be hanging out with each of you alumni brothers and sisters from every year celebrating Monterey Bay Academy. Ah, to reminisce about dorm life and the delicacies in the cafeteria, those glorious sunsets and sneak hanging out at the beach, to be social distancing long before anybody knew what social distancing was. The only way this could be any better is if we were all together in the sanctuary among that glorious, iconic red sea of carpet that flows majestically from one brick wall to the other side of the brick wall. Pick the pew that you love, roll up in there, and we'd enjoy this. I really was looking forward to all of that, but as we are in this particular predicament, not to mention the COVID-20 is a real thing, let's just take this year off and get together next year when we're all feeling and looking a little bit better. But in all honesty, it has been a very difficult year, hasn't it? Pandemic, social unrest, economic uncertainty, and so many other issues have pounded against the shores of our glorious campus, as well as across this beautiful nation that we all enjoy together. It has been tough. So today, allow me to share a thought that will help us process through moving from this season to the next season that God has in store for all of us. Those of us who have graced the halls of Monterey Bay Academy and those of you who are moving into the next season of your life from Monterey Bay Academy. Let's pray. God, for just a few moments today, would you bless us and grace us with your presence? And remind us that even amidst all of this, we always have the choice to rejoice and give you thanks. Bless us, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Paul writes the following words in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Rejoice always. 
always pray continually and give thanks in all circumstances. All circumstances? All circumstances. This is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Honestly, the initial question that struck me was, what in the world does Paul know about living in the 21st century? How does this Mediterranean tent maker living before 100 AD supposed to advise me about living in 2021? How does he even understand how the world works for me? I mean, we've been living in a worldwide pandemic. People around us have been getting sick. Some have died. Those that we've loved dearly have passed away. Fires and natural disasters has kind of taken over the scene the climate scene around us. Even Monterey Bay Academy here, we've lost one of our precious buildings. Parents, they've been stuck, not stuck, they've been blessed, blessed to be with their children during the isolation times while trying to work. They've been chefs, they've been chauffeurs, they've been their best friends and their enemies. They've had to be doctors and nurses to these children who are always around always around. There's been social unrest in our country. The government has become harder and harder for us to trust. There's been an economic downturn, then we've had help, and then it's still falling apart. I mean, 2020 and 2021 have really not been easy for any of us. Not to mention the mental health issues that many are struggling with due to all kinds of things. Where does Paul have the audacity to tell us to be grateful. How does he do that from his purview that sees nothing about our life today? Paul doesn't have internet. Paul doesn't understand smartphone. Paul doesn't get the transportation scenarios that we have. Paul doesn't see the population boom and the, in the, the post-industrial revolution that's happened. Paul doesn't know that about life. He has no idea there's a World War I and World War II. He hasn't seen all the things that has happened around our world. How can Paul tell me to be grateful when he hasn't lived enough life to know what I'm going through? It's like my children who are always trying to give me advice about all kinds of things, especially about driving. Dad, you're driving too fast. Dad, you're driving too slow. Dad, speed up. Dad, too much. Dad, stop. It's red. Dad, it's green. Hey, 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 people. You don't have the right to tell me how to live. You can barely read right now. Why are you still trying to tell me how to drive? This is how I often feel about Paul when I hear him say things like rejoice in all circumstances. Paul, you don't know my 21st century circumstance. But as we take a closer look at Paul's life and seeing how the Bible accounts for all the things he's been through and then hearing his writings, we might call him the LeBron James of the New Testament. For those of you who don't know LeBron James because you've been living on Mars, LeBron James is one of the best basketball players in history and is still playing today and plays for one of the best teams in the universe, the Los Angeles Lakers. Go Lakers! LeBron James has been to the finals 10 times in his career. He's been playing for a long time. He's brought our 17th championship to the Lakers. So this is one individual who knows how to get to the finals. He's been through it enough times that you trust he has the experience not just to say the things he says, but to do it as well. Paul is this character for the New Testament. He doesn't just say these things in a vacuum because he's never been through it. But as we listen to his experiences, we realize he has been through enough experiences that his words are not just words. He's actually been there. Listen to 2 Corinthians as Paul shares some things he's been through. Thrice, he says, I've been beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. How many of you out there have been stoned lately? Anybody? Have you been through a stoning? Yeah, it doesn't feel good. I'm, I'm supposing. I can only imagine. I've been beaten with a rod as a child, but if somebody beat me right now, you better believe I have the right to be bitter, to complain, to be angry about it. Paul says he's been beaten with rods three times and he'd been stoned. Thrice I was suffered shipwreck. Thrice. Three times this man's been suffered uh, in shipwreck. 
a night and a day. I've been in the deep. Uh, any of you been in the deep for a night and a day? In journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robber, in perils by mine own countrymen, his own peoples were coming after him. He was in peril. This man was in peril so much, it would give me a little bit of an identity issue. I, I definitely would start getting a complex. It's At first, it would be, you know, it's the people you hang out with. But after a while, if all the people you hang out in the places you go, there's peril, maybe you're the issue here. Paul. Maybe you're the issue. Paul continues on to talk about his perils with heathens, peril in the city, perils in the wilderness, perils at sea, perils amongst false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Listen, both of those things are bad. Cold and being naked. But what's worse than that is being cold and naked. Could you imagine how many of us have been naked lately that against our own will, against our own choice? This is what's happening to Paul. Besides all these things without, each of them I deal with daily. Paul has been dealing with this stuff daily. He's been burned. He's feeling weak. He's feeling broken. But I will glory of the things which concern my infirmities. I will boast about them. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, know that I do not lie. He's like, oh, let me, let me, let me straighten this out. I must boast in the Lord. I'm going to boast about my weakness. I don't remember the last time I had a testimony when I said, everybody, I want you to know, yesterday I was beaten, praise the Lord. No, that doesn't happen very often for me. He was imprisoned, and while he was imprisoned, writing from there, where he eventually dies, he continues to tell the people to give God glory and praise. I return to First Thessalonians, rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Oh, what does Paul know that allows him to proclaim with such vigor to rejoice always and give thanks in all circumstances while he awaits death? I think Paul recognizes that there are seasons in our life by which we will struggle and the world around us seems like it will fall completely and fully apart. But I also believe that he has had enough experiences, huh? There we go. Not just talking the talk, but having been through experiences. He's had enough experiences to know that in those seasons when we are struggling and tempted to complain and become bitter, it will only create more bitterness. Even if we had the right, even if we were in the right to complain and be bitter and to hate, it only births and creates more bitterness. It only begets more hate. It only infuses more discouragement in our life. And so we have a choice while we are in these seasons. We can either become the kind of people that break down and become discouraged and allow that to breathe more discouragement and hate and anger, or we can choose to be rejoicing. We can choose to be grateful. We can choose to look towards the season that God has coming for us. And as we recognize that season that comes for us, we can be agents to bring about the change of goodness. We have enough people in this world who are angry, who are hateful, who are divisive, who would rather spend their time talking down someone else. We can choose to be agents of goodness in our world. You and I, whether you graduated 50, 60 years ago, whether you graduated 20 years ago, or like myself, whether you graduated just last year, or whether you're graduating this year or next year, we can all make this choice together. How powerful would the church be if the world could look upon us from our differences and our diversity, and we are all in one spirit? This is what it means to lead the world. Let's not give up. Don't allow the spirit of discouragement to stop us from moving forward because God is having a new season come into our life. And if we stop now, 
we may not make it to where God has in store for us. Could you imagine if Joshua stopped going around Jericho's walls on the sixth and a half time because the first five times nothing had changed? Could you imagine him telling his soldiers, hey guys, you know what? We've been around this place already six times and, and, and we're, we're almost completing another round. Let's just stop. This, it's, this is ridiculous. Nothing's happening. And they quit. They would never experience the walls crushing down. Could you imagine if Moses, when he gets down into the Red Sea, down in that cul-de-sac, and the Egyptians begin to line up on the top, and they see him, and Moses gets frightened, and instead of following the instructions of God to strike the water, he gives up in defeat, turns around, and the people go back to Egypt under oppression. Could you imagine Naaman, who was instructed to go and dip down into the Nile seven times, and as he's going, maybe on the sixth time, maybe all he needs to do was go one more time, but he stops because he's so tired of how it has been going and not experiencing any change. The sores haven't gone away, they've gotten worse. The stench from the Nile, it keeps getting stronger. His sores are burning because of the dirty water, and he just gives up out of frustration. Wow. What about the three Hebrew boys. What if, as they were standing there, they looked at the fire, the fiery furnace, and it looked like it was getting hotter. They noticed everybody else was bowing down. How could their three measly lives make any difference? Why not just get into place and do what everybody else is doing? What if that was their mentality? How would it change all of these stories? If these people stopped just before they reached the precipice of the plans that God has for their life. What about that blind man who, when he was walking to the pool of Shalom, after Jesus told him to go wash his eyes there so that he could see again. What if he was walking there and just before he stepped into the pool, he thought to himself, I've come this far and nothing has changed. I can't tangibly experience God fixing this. I give up. Maybe it was just another man messing with me, put mud in my eyes, spat into there. I I, I give up on this. Forget it. And he doesn't step into the pool of change and healing that Jesus had in store for him. You and I are in this particular kind of season where it's looking like it's just hard, where it's looking like it's impossible, where it looks like there's no way out. You and I, though, might be close to a turning point, so we must choose not to turn around. We must choose not to be bitter. We must choose not to be discouraged and continue forward. We might be just one dunk away from our breakthrough. We might be just one turn around from walls breaking down in our lives. We might be one step away from parting a Red Sea miracle in our own lives. We might be one fountain visit away from discovering and rediscovering sight that we had lost a long time ago. Ah, we must not turn back or turn around. We must be willing in faithfulness to keep moving forward. I know that right now situations in the world around us looks ugly. It seems like our world is falling apart. But if we continue to follow that route, it would only birth more bitterness and brokenness in us. Or we could choose to see the season that God has in store that's coming and be a part of the agency to bring that transformation, to bring reconciliation, change, goodness, and healing. However, If we do allow bitter spirits to continue and fester in us, it will create defeat and a shortened ability to move forward in faith towards the change that God has in store. Now, with all that said, the point isn't how far away we are from full recovery. The point is How do we carry on when our feet is tired, when our doubt is overshadowing, when peer pressure is overwhelming, when the goal seems too far away to reach? How do we do that when we are completely burned out? Some of us are overwhelmed and exhausted from all the things that we've been struggling through as a society and as a country. Some of us are more frightened to go outside than ever. 
but we must not allow that circumstance to stop us from forward momentum. And our struggle at this point is misguided. We shouldn't be focusing on when or if God will bring us out of our valleys, but what kind of light we can be to the valleys by which God sees fit for us to be in. Oh, that's a word. I hope you heard me. We must not be so focused in on when and if God is going to bring us out of the valley. Instead, focus on what kind of light we can be in the valley that God sees us fit to be in. Oh, we're in a tough season. True. Oh, there's troubled times right now. True. But God has us here as an agent for a particular reason. So you and I must figure out what kind of light we will be. Paul was in his valley when he was told, when he was speaking to those in Philippi. But even as I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. He tells them, he's encouraging them. He's the one on the chop block. He's the one who's going through difficult things. And he's the, also the one who's encouraging them for change. Paul had things figured out. He knew that whether in a good place or in a difficult place, that God was going to be able to get him through, that God was going to give him the strength for follow through, that he could be an agent for good, whether he is freed and on the mountaintop or whether he's in prison waiting for persecution. His choice was always to speak good and rejoice in all circumstances. I know it may not be the easiest of times, but it's more necessary now than ever to key in on how to be glad and how to rejoice and how to be grateful. It's in these moments that our faith blossoms into true joy. We must make decisions to do right. Viktor Frankl. Austrian neurologist, Holocaust survivor, and author who writes Man's Searching for Meaning. Fantastic book. I, I, I invite you to go pick it up. Writes this, between the stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. Between what stimulus your anxieties as well as this, what stimulates your hope and how you will respond is the power for you and I to choose, to choose how we will respond. Between your stress and sorrow for the times that we live in and God's resolve for it, between you and I's difficulties with the pandemic and the difficulty with economic issues and not seeing a way out, and God's answer is a space by which you and I can resolve to either choose to be positive or to negative, to be an agent in this moment for change or to be changed by the circumstance. I pray that you and I choose to respond in that freedom to be grateful in all circumstances. Bitterness leads to more bitterness. Anger leads to more blame. We will be in seasons where which will grow and will and will suffer. But if we choose correctly, if we choose to be grateful and to praise and to rejoice, our life and our spirit will follow likewise. Today, Paul says to us in all circumstances, whether mountaintop experience or a valley experience, be grateful to rejoice and to be an agent for God. As I close today, for those of you who may not know, I want to remind you that as I came through Monterey Bay Academy, I was an undocumented immigrant and I had a lot of struggles coming through school I didn't know how I was going to make it. And if it were not for agents like Bill Karasoma, David, Laura, if it were not for the Meharis of the world and the Bowers, if it were not for a Ted, the Principal Ted, if it were not for those who were part of the school that helped raise me, uh, Dean Rouse and, 
and all of these individuals, Dean, Bonnie, friends who came through the school with me like Daniela Vilches and Faye Robinson, people who cared for me and who, who believed in me, who, who put me into opportunities that I could grow, I would not be here today. These individuals chose to be an agent of good in my life. And even whilst I was not able to see the next season God had in store for me, I had to move forward in faith to know that he had something planned. And I want to praise God today. I sit in this office, working here in this conference, caring for my children, watching over my parents, being with my siblings and making a difference in the world. Because in those moments, with the other agents around me for light, it gave me the power to choose not to live bitter, not to be discouraged, but to rejoice and be thankful in all circumstances. May God bless you as we move from this season to the next to choose always to be grateful and to rejoice in all things. Let's pray. God, thank you for our time together. Bless all of those who are participating in our alumni weekend. May you grant them the spirit and the heart to rejoice, to be grateful in all circumstances. Remind them that while you do not show your work tangibly at times, you are still working, that you do not sleep nor do you slumber. But bless us to be able to join in the great work of a transformational season. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you.